We're gonna we're gonna read and preach and go for it all, all here at the same time here in just a second. But I want to give you I want to give you a background, make sure you understand where we are in this situation. Uh, the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt for a really long time. They were in bondage. God went and He called them out. He brought them out of Egypt with all kinds of mighty signs and wonders. He came against every god that the Egyptians had and showed that he, God, was better, stronger, more powerful than each and every one that they worshipped. And that he brought the children of Israel, also showing them that he was more powerful than all the gods of the land that they were in bondage to. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he brought them out of Egypt and was taking them to the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. And here we are getting ready to hear in Numbers uh, God said, send them out, send out a, a leader from each tribe, uh, from the 12 tribes of Israel. So they, they elected 12 men, sent them to spy out the land, this promised land, this land that God said he was going to give them as their inheritance forever. Uh, note they're still in that land today. I just want to throw that out there. The same Israel is still Israel today. They had a little bit of hiccup there for a few hundred years, but they're back. Praise the Lord. God is able to do what he said he was going to do and continue to do it for all eternity as long as he sees fit, right? Amen. So these 12 spies, they went out and they spied the land. When they came back, two of them, Joshua and Caleb, said, hey, man, that's good land. Let's go. Let's do it. And then 10 of them said, ah, ah. I mean, it's nice. They got some fruit. And it sure is a good land. But... You gotta watch out for that blood, right? Unless it's but God. But if it's but anything else, you gotta watch out. There's giants in the land, and they got big old walls, and they're just there's tons of them, and we're little old grasshoppers, and oh, what was me? And they stirred up the people against the word of the Lord to go and take the land. So then God got angry and said, All right, children, if you don't want to have this land, then you ain't gonna get it. You're gonna wander in the desert. For each, uh, they spent 40 days over there spying out the land. Uh, a year for each day you were over there in the promised land. You're going to roam the desert. And so then the next day, they got up and said, Oh, no, we will go take it now. <laughs> and they sinned again against the Lord, trying to take the promised land without God, trying to do it all on their own. And, of course, they got whooped and ran out of town. And uh, it was just it was a sad time. So... We pick up here in chapter 14 after that sad time where they have been disobedient twice to the Lord, once in not doing what he said, as far as not going and taking the promised land that he offered them, and then disobedient again in trying to take the promised land without him when he said, no, I'm sending you to go into the desert. So this is where we pick up in chapter 14. Such a wonderful chapter as it may be. Chapter 14, verse 1, it says, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. They were sad. They didn't get what they were supposed to get, and it was all their fault. There was nobody to blame but their own, and they had just been whooped by this enemy that God said, I had given to your hands. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, I love how it keeps using congregation. We ever use that word anywhere in church as a congregation? Okay, anyway, move on. <clears throat> the whole uh, congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? I think today we say, would to God, at least that's how I say it. Would to God that somebody would praise the Lord up in this place. You know what I'm saying? Okay, nobody took the opportunity. Amen. Okay. Hey, I'll take it. All right. <laughs> Close enough. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Now, Egypt is almost always in the Bible. I won't put a 100% declaration on it. But Egypt is almost always a, a symbol of going back into the world. 
of going back into sin, of going back into bondage, of going against God, leaving God, and doing something in your own flesh, in your own power. Mm -hmm. So here they are. They've done left and been freed from sin, been freed from bondage, been set free from slavery. And now they want to take and elect their own people to go back. Because at least over there, I don't know. There really isn't nothing. Because everything they're talking about here is fear that has not come to pass. You see, so far they're, they're just speculating on, man, our wives are going to be taken, our children are going to be taken, we're going to end up uh, as nothing, we might as well just go back and be slaves. At least we'll be together, I guess. That's what they were thinking. This is a very interesting passage because it, it, it's a symbol of how the church, oh, how the church acts sometimes, and it brings us down to two types of Christians, especially when we get into days uh, like we have today. We, we kind of sing about it, I praise God, uh, this morning, when we get into days that are wilderness-type days. We got, we got all kinds of wars and rumors of wars. We got all kinds of pestilence on the other side. We got high prices that are leading to famine. We got all kinds of things going on in what is supposed to be the, the greatest nation on the face of the planet. People are literally dying to come to the land that we live in, and yet we're facing things that we have not faced before, at least in our lifetime and our generation. And when things get a little rough, People have a tendency to say, man, it was easier when I was living for the world. I guess I'm just going to go back. This Christian thing is just too difficult. Mm. And you say, Pastor, come on now. They, they weren't Christians. They weren't saved. Were they not all in bondage in Egypt? Yeah. Yeah. Did God not bring them all out of slavery, yeah. all out of bondage, yeah. all out of sin and out of the world yeah. to take them to the promised land? Amen. Okay, then they were all as one, known as the congregation. Amen. Hey, now, come on. The church. Yeah. And yet here they are saying, I don't like these leaders, God, that you've given us. I don't like that pastor. He preached too long. I don't like that worship leader. He plays songs too long. It's 30 minutes. My goodness, how long do you need to worship the Lord for? Let's get to the message and get home like I got a roast. <laughs> come on. I don't like that Sunday school teacher. He just be just saying things all the time, talking stuff. That just, ugh. I don't like these leaders we have. Let's elect somebody else. Let's start our own church. Let's start our own. Oh, boy, I tell you what, this is a wonderful message this morning. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let's do our own thing. Because <coughs> we don't like what it is that God has given us. Oh, oh, oh. God gave them their leaders yeah. to yes. lead them. Mm -hmm. Now here's the interesting thing. These children were going to have to go through the wilderness, these children of God. The leaders were going to have to go through it too. Amen. They didn't want to go through it. They had to walk through the wilderness 40 years just like everybody else. But they were willing to submit to God and go through that wilderness because that's what God called them to do. Yeah. Lead my people through this mess. I would say that there are leaders in the church today, pastors, and I'm talking about the whole church body, that as soon as opposition comes knocking at their door, you can't talk about LGBTQ. You can't talk about anything good and positive for white people. You can't talk about male and female, only two, two genders. You can't. You gotta submit to Black Lives Matter. You gotta submit to critical race theory. You can't proclaim that abortion is wrong. There's leaders, we've done seen it, they'll bow down and kowtow to whatever the world says, because as soon as the world comes against them, they're like, all right, I ain't going to that wilderness. Yeah. I'm going back to Egypt too. Yeah. I'm not walking my people through this mess. I, I think I'm going to take the easy route. Yeah. We see it all over television. We see it all over leaders throughout North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Won't dare step on those hot button issues. No. My Lord, they might get kicked off YouTube. Somebody FBI might come knocking at their house. Huh? Dear Lord, can't do that. And instead of leading their people where they're supposed to go, you understand they had to get through the wilderness to get to the promised land. You understand if they had never went through the wilderness and decided they wanted to go back to Egypt or, I don't know, pick any other country, they'd have never made it to the promised land. Amen. That's right. Man, I want to get to the promised land. Oh. Now, 
Let's just spend a second right here on that promised land. The promised land they were going to, we all as Christians like to say that's heaven. And I say we're close. The promised land is not the promised land. The promised land, sure, is heaven with the E-D on the end of it. God has promised us a hope and a future. God has promised us mansions and glory. God has promised us that where he is there, I will be also. Huh, come on. But the promised land that they were going to, it had the world in it. It had people that had to be defeated in it. When I go to heaven, I ain't going to fight no more battles. Come on. There was sin in the promised land. It had to be cast out. There was a fight, a struggle constantly. God said, don't do like the rest of them do, because if you do, you'll end up worshiping their people, and then you'll end up sinning against me and committing fornication with the world. Don't be like those people that you're going into that land. Amen. So what is the promised land? Well, I'll tell you real quick. The promised land is that life and that life more abundantly that God wants to give you right here, right now on this earth. To be in the world, but not of the world. Amen. Oh, to live in a land flowing with milk and honey, no matter what everything else is going on around you. God said, I've given you victory. I've made you more than a conqueror. I've given you all kinds of promises that I will never leave you nor forsake you. That you will not be baking bread. You will be victorious in this land that I've given you now. Amen. Amen. If you'll just submit to Christ, if you'll just walk according to his ways, if you'll just reject the world and all the gods that the world serves. Ooh, the world serves a lot of gods. Back in the Bible days, we'd call them out. Baal and Malek and all the rest of them. Today, we just, oh, I don't want to offend. I'll just call it out as satanic. Just covers it all, yes? Evil. Covers it all. Where? Aborting babies to the altar of convenience. We're leaving the world and doing this ex-evangelical deconstruction mess because somebody stepped on our toes in the church and we can't handle a little bit of correction or a little bit of guidance or a little bit of feelings getting hurt. And I tell you, when I read the Bible, I get, I get my feelings hurt all the time. All the time. This thing is a mirror. When I look into it, I see all kinds of flaws. It shows me where I, I fail and mess up constantly. And i got to say, God, forgive me and help me to have victory. And he does. The person I am today is not the person I was 20, 30, 40 years ago. Amen. 40 years ago, I was a little baby. But still, <laughs> not the same person. <laughs> Praise God. These people had come out of slavery, come out of bondage, come out of the world. And yet, here they were saying, it's too difficult. The price of gas is too high, God. There's not enough stuff in the store. I got to end up doing all this crazy mess to be able to live for you, God. It's just, it's too difficult. I'm going back to the world. I'm going back to Egypt. And I'm going to elect my own leaders and take them, take them there. Or have them take me there. Pick it up in verse 5. It says, Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. Again, they were all one people. It didn't say he fell on the group that was just murmuring and complaining. It didn't say he fell on his face before this, you know, minor 10 or 12 or 15 people over here. No, before all the congregation of all the assembly of all the children of Israel. There we go. There was two different types of people in this congregation, but they were together. They were under one leadership, under one guidance. You know God had a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night? You ever think about that thing about how good it is? God, why do you do this? Why not, I don't know, a, 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 just a, a floating star? <laughs> Anybody ever been out in the wilderness? In the daytime, it's hot. And it's so nice when a cloud comes by and blocks out the sun so that you can walk in the shade. Oh, and then at nighttime, the temperatures drop. They get so cold, you're out there shivering without a blanket. Isn't it nice to have a big old fire come by and warm you at nighttime? God wanted them to walk and move in comfort. Oh, the good life. Life and life more abundant now. Amen. Not having to wait to heaven to get to 70 degree or 68 degree, whatever your perfect temperature is. <laughs> and where it'll be perfect in heaven, no doubt. If I sweat in heaven, I won't let What's that all about? <laughs> And they were shaded in the daytime and kept warm in the nighttime. Boy, I tell you what, how good is God? Even still walking through the wilderness with shade and heat and manna from heaven. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
How good is God? And he's wanting to do that now. Amen. Amen. But we got people murmuring and complaining, wanting to go back to Egypt. Mm -hmm. Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. Verse 6 says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. It was a, it was a tradition. I, I praise God it's not so much anymore. But it was a tradition, and it still is in the Jewish community, when you hear something blasphemous, when you hear something so terrible, maybe it's it's an unexpected tragedy of a loved one dying, or maybe somebody says something against God, and it's, again, blasphemous. You hear something just so terrible that you just rip your clothes to show that it's just, this is just terrible. And they, they rip their clothes, and, and Moses and Aaron fell face down before the congregation when they heard what the children of Israel were trying to do. You want to go back into sin? What are you talking about? That's crazy. You want to go back into slavery? Ah, what are you talking about? What kind of foolishness is that? No, you want to go back and live in the world? No. 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 Look what God has done for you. It says, and they spake, verse 7, unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, the land which we possessed through to search it is an exceeding good land. These two guys, Joshua and Caleb, they spoke again after trying to speak the first time, saying, hey, let's go get this land. And everybody coming against them. Now they speak again and say, listen, the land that God is taking us to, that's the good life. The Christian walk, that's the good life. Submit yourself to God. That's the good stuff. Not the ways of the world, not the promises of the world. No, the promises of God, the ways of God, that's the good stuff. Where God wants to take you, where he wants to lead you. In this life. Oh, that's the promise of God. Amen. We know, as, as our Sunday school teacher brought up when Lazarus died, you know, his sisters were like, Lord, we know he'll rise again <coughs> in the resurrection. Yeah, we all know heaven. We all understand there's a, a life on the other side. But Jesus was like, no, 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 no. I, I want him to be raised now. Amen. I want to raise this dude now. He's going to have life now. Amen. And they just couldn't. They couldn't grasp it until, of course, Christ did it. And it was like, oh. And, of course, then they complained, Lord, he stinks. Are you sure? Are you sure you want to stop that to the Lord? I don't know. It's been four days. Ooh, I can only imagine. Come on. See this picture this morning. It says, The land we searched it was an exceeding good land. Verse 8 If the Lord delighted us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. If you follow the will of God, Read that first part again. If the Lord delighted us. You know, we put a lot of if on that. Mm. We put a lot of umph on that. Because we know how just how garbage we are. Mm. Nobody knows your past better than you. Nobody knows your sin better than you. That's right. Nobody knows your mess better than you. And the things that you are still holding on to saying, Lord, I'm not worthy. Mm. And that's difficult. But I want to let you know, I have read through the Bible, and there's many people in the Bible that were just garbage, <laughs> just like me. And yet, that it says that they pleased God. They found favor with God. That they were a man after God's own heart. Oh, come on here. Come on here. Solomon was a mess. I just used him. He was my most recent. I, I spoke to my son, my poor son. He got caught up in the Bible study I was doing the other day. He was like, I just want to go back to doing what I was doing. But I wouldn't let him come. I was having too much fun. God came. So Solomon sacrificed like a thousand bulls before the Lord just because he loved God so much. And he was doing something. He wanted to build a temple for God. And he, was, he, he just had this longing for God. So one night God comes to him in a dream and he asks him what he wants. He said, ask me anything and I'll give it to you. And Solomon, again, because he wanted to please God so much, because he loved God so much, he had this relationship with God. 
He said, Lord, I, I can't rule these people. I don't know. Who can decide over all these things? Lord, please give me wisdom to understand how to be the king that you have called me to be, how to do the job that you have called me to be. I just want to do it good. I just want to do it to the best of the ability that you can give me. And it said this thing that he said, this question, this, this longing that he had, it said, it pleased God. Solomon pleased God. So then God said, because you didn't ask for all these other things, I'm going to give them to you too and give you the thing you asked for. Come on. Why? Because he pleased God? Because he had this relationship with God? Because he had a longing for God? He had a longing to be in the promises of God, to live according to God's ways and God's purposes, and he had life, and life more abundantly in his current life. Amen. Amen. Not talking about where he went after death. Said, if the Lord delights in us, let me tell you something. The Lord delights in you if you follow his ways. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's it. There it is. It's real simple. Do it God's way. And all of a sudden, boom, you'll start finding delight in the Lord, and the Lord will find delight in you. Said, you, you must believe that God is, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So with faith, it's possible to please God. Not because of your sins. Right? Not because you're good enough. No, because you have faith in God and you're going in His way. Amen. You're living His way, trying to do what He called you to do. If the Lord delights in us, man, that's huge. That's a big if. But it doesn't rest on what you do as far as your own personal decisions. It relies, relies on what you do according to God's decisions, according to God's ways. All you have to do is submit. Submit to the Lord. Walk according to the Spirit and not after the flesh and you will have life. That's what Romans tells us. If the Lord has found pleasure in us, if, if, if we please the Lord, if he delights in us, then he will bring us into this land. He will give us that life and give it to us more abundantly now. That land flowing with milk and honey. Listen, Psalm says all around, this fits right here, it's, it's a chapter that was been spoken to me one day, I'll tell the story. It says a thousand may fall on one side, ten thousand on the other, but it shall not touch you. Yeah. Arrows can fly by, by pestilence, it all can come at you, but you shall not be harmed. Yeah. You can be living a life flowing with milk and honey in the midst of a wilderness. That's right. In the midst of when everything else around you is garbage. Inflation, gas prices, pestilence, COVID, uh, all the mess on the news that they're legalizing that needs to be uh, illegal because it's against God's word. It's a sin, but yet we're legalizing sin left and right in the nation that's supposed to be one nation under God, and yet we seem to be one nation serving many gods and abandoning God. You can live a life flowing with milk and honey. Amen. Come on, this is, this is what this is about. Amen. Only rebel not, verse 9. Only rebel not. Rebellion is next to what? Witchcraft. Oh, we heard that sometime last week. Mm -hmm. Only rebel not. Somebody said to know what you're supposed to do and not do it to you. That's sin. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. Rebel not. against the Lord. Neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. There you go. Huh. Yeah. They ain't nothing but bread. We're going to use them to give us what we need. They're sustenance to us. They're over there plowing in their fields, and actually they're plowing seeds, and we're going to harvest what they plow. Right. Amen. Huh? God said he'd take the world's money and give it to us. He'd take the sinner's stuff and give it to us. He would bless us with the sinner's mess. Go back and read it. I'm telling you, that's what the Bible says. He'll take it from the heathen, heathen and give it to the saved, to the Christian. That's what he says. They're plowing in my fields. They're sowing my crops. Huh, come on. God will, take, God will take all kinds of people's mess. Take it right from them and bless you with it. Because he wants to. Because he's a good God. Amen. That's right. And it's not because you're so great. It's because those people are rebelling. 
That's what we read it last time. The reason they were wanting to go take this land yeah. is because they were rebelling against the Lord. Yes, God said it's time for them to get out of this land. Amen. And I'm giving it to you. Yes, Rebel not against the Lord. Don't be afraid of these people that bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. These buts. Here we go again. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. Mm. They wanted to stone Joshua and Caleb for what they just said. They wanted to pick up stones and kill these people for telling them the truth. Pray to God that whenever you guys eventually do that, you'll use the little rotten tomatoes and pumpkins. Please don't throw stones. <laughs> Please don't throw stones. <laughs> But all the congregation made uh, uh, stones, stoned them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. Listen, God had to step in and stop what was about to happen. He had to step on the scene for a second. Get everybody's attention. Got to do it. He'll come to your rescue each and every time. Right here it is. He rescued those people that were preaching and teaching the truth. Verse 11, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them. Now listen, I want to show you about this word signs. In other translations it says miracles. This is an interesting word. So you got my definition up there for me. There it is. There it is in the Hebrew language. It's, it's, it's number 226 if you want to go look it up in your concordance. But it means signs, miracles, as pledges or attestation of divine presence or interposition. I put in the back, intervention. Attestation means a testimony. God says, how long am I going to put up with these people? He All of a sudden, he's talking to Moses. How long am I going to put up with these people? How long will it be that they, they refuse to believe me after all the signs and miracles that I've done as a pledge or a testimony of my divine presence and intervening in their life? Oh, wow. So you mean the miracles, signs, and wonders were evident in their life that God was with them? Yeah. First, he brought them out of Egypt that way. We remember that. Hello. He, he brought them out of the world with miracle signs and wonders. When you get saved, my God, that's a miracle. Amen. Amen. All of a sudden, your uh, address changes from 101 Hale Street to Main Street Heaven. Amen. Come on. Amen. 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 What a miracle. All of a sudden, there's a change in your heart. There's a change in your mind. There's a change inside of you. Amen. Yes. God takes all that old mess out. He says, you're a new creation, a new creature. The old is gone. The old all things are made new. Hallelujah. Then he begins to perform miracles in your life. God, I'm addicted to this. I'm going to let you lay it down. Watch this. Boom. God, I need healing over here because all those years in sin have messed me up. Boom. I'm going to give you healing. Amen. There you go. God, I, I don't have a background. I've done wasted all my time. I can't go and, and make any kind of a living. Boom. I'm going to drop a... A, a, a job right in your life. Amen. Come on, how many times has God done it for us? Over and over and over again. Amen. As signs of a pledge or a testimony that He's working divinely, yeah. His presence is in our lives. Amen. Amen. That's, That's what He said. How long am I going to keep up with these people that deny me and talk garbage about me? After I've done all this in their life. Oh, let this hit home this morning. Come on, let this hit home this morning. We murmur and complain about God. I don't know why you let such and such happen. Bro. Come on, we murmur and complain about God. And God's like, how long are you not going to see the signs that I have put right in front of your face? Of my divine presence in your life. Mm. Verse 12 says, I will smite them. With the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a great nation and a mightier than they. God says, Moses, I'll use you. How about that? We're going to start over. They want to choose a new leader. I'm going to choose a new people. How about that? Ooh, Lord. 
Lord, please don't choose a new church. Oh, come by here, Lord, anytime you want. Don't That's choose right. a new church, God. Don't kick us out. That's right. Amen. Amen, somebody. Yes. Come on. Amen. God, forgive us for murmuring and complaining. He goes on, and Moses goes on to plead for the people with God. I want you to see this now. And he pleads with God, and God says, okay, I ain't going to kill him. Now, those ten, they was already in trouble. You go back and read about those ten that came back and gave a bad report and stirred up the whole congregation against uh, uh, what Joshua and Caleb said. You'll read those ten didn't make it. But God then says, listen, then you're going to wander through the wilderness. You're going to go through for 40 years living in wilderness. And you're not going to see the promised land. Here's where we get to the two type of Christians. There are two type of Christians that have two very different relationships with God. One, there's a Christian that says, what can salvation do for me? Well, you got me out of Egypt. God, oh God that sounds great. Now what can you do for me? You mean I got to go through a test and a trial? No, thank you. What else can you do for me? You mean I got to submit? No, I don't want to do that. No, thank you. What else can you do for me, God? Well, Lord, if this is all you got, then I think I'll just go back and live for the world. Mm. What can salvation do for me? That's about what these children of Israel were talking. Mm. That, that, that land over there, that's too big of a job. That's too big of a task. I, that sounds like work, God. I ain't trying to go work. I know the Bible says you prepared me unto good works, God, but Lord, that's too much. I ain't doing that. And there's this other group, Joshua and Caleb and Moses and Aaron and Miriam and all those others. They went out there they submitted to the Lord. They had a right relationship with God. They had the relationship that was correct with the Lord. It wasn't about what salvation could do for them. It's about what salvation already did for them. Amen. Yes. God, you've already saved me. What more do you want? God, you've already healed me. What more can I give you? God, I submit myself to you. I give you all of me. What more can I do to show you I love you and worship you, God? You want me to live this way? Yes. You want me to live that way? Yes. You want me to go here? Yes. Here I am. God, send me. Amen. Not what can salvation do for me? No, God, you've already done it all. As Paul says, I, I'm now bought with the price. I'm a slave to Christ. I, I'm not on my own. There were two different types walking through that wilderness. We get over here towards the end of the chapter. I want to reread verse 11. So I'm going to go ahead and give me verse 11 again. I'm going to do verse 11, and then I'm going to jump to, I believe it's verse 20. It says in verse 11, The Lord said unto Moses, How long will all this people provoke me, and how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs, remember that was miracles, that was testimonies that God was with them and in their life. For all the signs which I have showed among them. Then Moses fights for the people on the people's behalf and going to intercede to God for these people. And it says in verse 20, because God was going to wipe them out right there. He says, and the Lord says in verse 20, I have pardoned according to thy word. So God said, all right, I'm not going to wipe them out and start over. But, verse 21, as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. God is almost swearing by, if I can use it that way, that since the earth is filled with my glory, you can count on this next thing that I say. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. Wow. We have Christians coming to church on the regular, walking through the wilderness. They claim Christianity. They come to church like a Christian. Yet in their life, there is no land flowing with milk and honey, ever. There's no peace in their life. There's constant struggle in their life. Everything they do seems to come to failure and not prosperity or success. Why? Because they're walking through the wilderness in this life. 
God said, I, God said I, I, I blessed you with so many miracles, and yet you won't quit complaining. You won't quit arguing. You won't quit murmuring. You won't quit longing for Egypt, longing for the world, longing for the old ways, longing for that old life. <laughs> so these promises that I declare are yours, you just ain't going to see it. You're going to walk with the rest of them. You're going to go with the rest of them. Matter of fact, I'll even give you a preacher and a leader to walk you through. Make sure you got water in the desert. Make sure you got food in the desert. Mm. Mm. Wow. Mm. Right now, search your mind. You know any Christians out there that are living a wilderness type life? I ain't talking about those times when God takes us through the wilderness on purpose. Jesus went out in the wilderness. He was tempted for, for a purpose. And then just a few days later, he came back. Sometimes God takes us out to stretch us. we got to fast and pray during that time. He takes us out. He builds something up. He's doing something in our life. And then, okay, we're right back into the ministry where he wants us to be. He has to get us out of our own mess sometimes. Talk to us kind of rough sometimes. Moses went out there. God had a burning bush. Said, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I'm going to start something new, but I have to get you all the way out here to talk to you. Sometimes that's how it is. This is 40 years, folks. That's my whole entire life. Walking through the wilderness. So if you ain't going to see it, your kids will. But you ain't going to see it. Wow. Yeah, I know Christians like that. Everything they pray for seems not to happen. Their illnesses seem to take them over. Their bank account seems to always read zero. Their life seems to be in shambles every time I turn around. There's some other catastrophe hitting their home. Why? Why? Why are they not walking through the land full of milk and honey? How are they living in this world, living a mess? I would submit that it's murmuring, it's complaining, it's longing for Egypt, wanting to go back into the world, not willing to do what God has called you to do. When he said, go get the promised land and go take it, they said, no, it's too much, it's too hard, I'm not doing that. See, as I said before, the promised land is not heaven. But you can look at it as like a down payment. If God was able to take the children of Israel, who were a stiff-necked, stubborn generation, that's what the Bible says about them. It's not anti-Semitism, that's just what the Bible says about them. God said, I'm doing it for a reason. If I can save you, I can save anybody. God, come on, come look in your family. God saved the worst first. Come on. He can save you. He can save the rest of your family. Okay, I'll leave you alone. God promised them the promised land. Current, not promised, not future. God promised them the promised land. And then he got them there. No matter what came against them, kings tried to crush them, uh, 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 prophets tried to curse them, Come on, there was a whole mess they had to go through. But yet God got them to the promised land. And they are still there today. Come on. Man has got in and messed it up. The boundaries are jacked up. It's all a mess. But still, they're there today. As a sign that God's word is ever true. That God's promises are true. That you can count on God. And so if God can take the Jews to the promised land, he can take the church to the promised land. Amen. Oh, come on. Amen. However, there were some in the congregation that didn't make it. Mm. Son, give me that last scripture for me. Take you to Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to read it up here on the board. It says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Catch the parallels here between what we just read in the Old Testament in Numbers and what we're reading in Matthew. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, when I say go, you go. When I say stay, you stay. When I say get to, get to walk, and you walk. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have uh, cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? 
miracles were present in the church in numbers, if you can call them that, in the congregation in numbers. God said, I've done all these miraculous signs in your presence. How long am I going to put up with you? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You don't get to enter the promised land. Wow. 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 I plan on getting to that promised land. <clears throat> there is then, therefore, a connection between living in the promised land today, oh, come on, get this, yeah. and getting the hope of the promised land in glory. If your life resembles those that murmured and complained and went back into the world and wanted to go back into slavery and was always arguing and fussing and <clears throat> going against what the Lord wanted to be done, and your life doesn't look like what the Bible says that your Christian life will look like. Oh, we read it this morning. Come on. Oppressed but not crushed. Persecuted, not obeyed. Amen. Come on. Amen. Knocked down or cast down but not destroyed. That's right. Come on. Yes, the world will come against us, but we have a hope in the future. We have life and life more abundantly. We have victory now. We are more than a conqueror now. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world Amen. now. Amen. Amen. So if your life does not resemble the promises of God now, because it's nothing but wilderness and mess and garbage. And I would say that that's a good chance that you're not right with the Lord and in the right relationship with God to be able to make it to the promised land that is the life after this one. That could happen at any minute as soon as we hear that trumpet sound. Oh, turn off gravity, Lord. Let me go. You might have to turn off gravity to get me in there. You know what I'm saying? Anyway. It'll be a miracle. See me blind. Hallelujah. So there it is this morning. Look back over your life. And not talking about those moments, those times, 40 days in the wilderness. I'm not talking about those times where a month hits you and things were rough and tough and God was doing something. God was showing you his plan. I'm talking about the whole thing. You gave your life to Christ at whatever age, and here you are now, and it's been nothing but wilderness ever since. Sure, there's been miracles. Sure, there's been signs. Sure, there's been evidence that God is in your life. But man, there's this thing that Christians talk about, about having this great, victorious, overcoming life you don't know nothing about. Why? I reckon it's because of the relationship with you, have, you have with God is more about you and what he can do for you and less about what he's done for you and all about him. Amen. Ooh, ooh. Change your perspective. In other words, repent. Repent is to change your mind and to change your ways. Look up that word repent in the, in the concordance. You'll see it's a change of mind. I no longer want those things I used to want. I no longer go the way I used to go. I no longer long for those things. I no longer talk the way I used to talk. I no longer complain about the things I used to complain about. I am different. Change your mind and your perspective about who God is in your life. Say, God, it's not about me. It's about you. Lord, what can I do for you? How do I serve you? Moses was called a servant of God. When Joshua was time to take to take up the mantle for Joshua to be the warrior that God called him to be. Oh, come on here, because <laughs> only Yeshua can get you across the river into that promised land. But it's okay. When his time came, he said, my servant has died. It's your turn to serve. Oh, to be a servant of Christ. To be a servant of God. Oh, that Yeshua would lead us. That Jesus would lead us across that river into the promised land. Mm, come on, if you don't get that, go back and read all of that Torah and understand what's going on. The law can't get you there. Only Jesus can get you there. Come on, Amen. Hallelujah. 
What is your relationship with God? What does it look like? Is it in right standing this morning? Or are you more focused about what it can do for you? We approach salvation like we approach a job or a business deal. That ain't right. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our Lord. He's already paid the price for you. It is done. He said it is finished. Now walk in it. If you need anything from the Lord today, oh, it doesn't work. God is able to heal. God is able to save. God is able to move and set free. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly, far greater than we could ever think or imagine. Through us, in us, to us, 